But I have the pleasure to introduce to you today a dear friend and colleague of mine. If you guys want to take a seat, go ahead and take a seat. And uh, as you're taking a seat, I'll tell you a little bit about him. His name is Pastor Steve Pinto. Steve Pinto is a graduate of LABI College. I'm just saying, great things come from there. He holds a bachelor's degree from Vanguard University and he holds a master's degree in theology from Liberty University. He's not just our campus pastor. He's a faculty member. He's dean of spiritual formation. He sits on my cabinet. He's my personal spiritual advisor on all things related to the college. He's also an associate pastor at Faro Church. I spoke to some students about him because I wanted to share a couple things. And the student told me, this is a powerful man of God. That he is bringing evangelism to the community like no others. That it's time, according to Pastor Pinto, in their own words, to graduate from the pews and bring God's church to the community. With, just last month, I honored Pastor Pinto at the college with a Service of Excellence Award, and he deserves it. Put your hands together for my dear friend and pa pastor, Pastor Steve Pinto. Thank you, Dr. Hardy. Yo, what up? What up? Yo, you scared me coming up from behind me, bro. Santo. Halawale. Hey, it's good to be here to be able to share the word of God with you today. Hey, I want to talk to you about marriage, about single living, and about sex. Come on. Hashtag Chamo. C H A A M O N. Hashtag Chamo. I came up with that about a week ago. Oh, sorry. Jane Gibbons is a rapper, not me. Sorry. My bad. My bad. But I want to talk to you about marriage, singleness, and sex. And something that I've entitled No Shades. Of gray. No shades of gray. Now I heard that the, there's a movie coming out a couple of months here that it's called Fifty Shades of Gray. And it talks about sex and marriage and single living. And the idea is that there is 50, if not more unclear shades of what we can do and cannot do with our God-given sexuality. But I'm here to tell you this morning, the Lord brought me here this morning to tell you that His command, His will for you in terms of your sexuality is clear. There are no shades of gray. Come on! Tell your neighbor, come on! Tell your neighbor, come on, tell them. Tell them with an accent, come on. Come on. Now you need to understand something. You need to understand something about sex. Sex is God's idea. It was God who brought it about. And he has given us, because he invented it, he has given us clear directives for where we can act out our sexuality. It's called the boundary of marriage. Look, the Bible ain't difficult, man. Sex inside of marriage? Yeah! Come on! That's why I'm married. Come on, baby. Woo! About a week ago. And then outside of marriage, or before marriage, sin. No shades of gray. Nothing in the middle. God came up with the concept of sex. He knows how to use sex. And He created sex to be used within the boundaries of marriage. And anytime we take something that is good, 
God given, divinely given, given, and taken outside of its intended purpose, it's always going to be damaging to us, damaging to those that we love. And even if we don't feel like we're hurting ourselves or others, we are ultimately sinning against God, the giver of the gift in the first place. Chamo, tell your neighbor, Chamo. Man, I want to talk to you about sex because everybody else is talking about sex, man. So I said the church has got to talk about sex too. Because it was God who invented it. God knows how to use it. Now, the Bible is very clear about the concept of sex, especially in, a, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So matter of fact, if you have your Bible at youth convention, would you open up to you the 1 Corinthians chapter 7? I mean, can we open the Bible at youth convention? Come on! 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. I have it up here in the projections for you. Would you read it for me? Ready? Let's read it together. One, two, three. Now for the matters you wrote about, is it good for a man not to marry? All right, let me give you some context here. Some young people in the church of Corinth, which was a very worldly church, by the way, back in the day when people wanted to party, they would go to the city of Corinth. As a matter of fact, if you look at history books, when young people wanted to go party, they would say, let's go Corinthianize. Let's go Corinthianize. And so these young people in the city of Corinth had some questions. Uh, to Paul, the great apostle. And they want to know, hey, is it better to remain single and ready to mingle? Or is it more holy to be married? What's better, man? We want to know how to express our sexuality. What's right? What's wrong? And so, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the apostle Paul begins to answer those questions. And it's kind of weird how he gives his answer, by the way. He's like bipolar. I mean, later on we can read that chapter because homeboy will start saying, hey, you know what, it's better to be single. No, 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 wait, wait hold on. It's better to be married. No, wait, I changed my mind. It's better to be single. No, wait, again, I changed my mind. It's better to be married. Like a ping pong, uh, watching a ping pong game. First Corinthians chapter seven, like this. Back hurts, man, your name. Like a tennis match. And so Paul, even as he's writing this, doesn't, uh, doesn't come to a, a clear conclusion as to what's better, to be single or to be married. Now, I think it was a good idea for these young people in Corinth to ask the Apostle Paul this question. Because the Apostle Paul, it is believed that at one time or another, he was married. So he was single and he was married. Now, a lot of theologians think that he was married at one time or another because the Bible teaches us that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Jew of Jews, meaning that he wanted to be observant of the law to the T. And if a Jew, and if, I, if, a, if a male Jew was not married by the age of 20, he was considered to be simple. And so, uh, it is believed that he was married. Not only that, he also was part of the Sanhedrin. 71 Jews who knew the law forward and backward. And they would rule and judge over the affairs of the Jewish people. And in order to be part of that council, guess what? You had to be what? Married. So he was single. He lived a single life. But then it's assumed he was married. But then in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we think maybe, maybe, you know what happened to his wife? She died. And so he's widowed. He's sing he is single again. So it's a good question to ask Paul. Hey, Paul, is it better to be single or married? Because he was, he was both single, married, and then he was widowed. So it's a good thing to come with a good question to an experienced man called the Apostle Paul. And so the Apostle Paul was going to begin to deal with this question, hey, what's, what's better? Is it better to marry or is it better to remain single? And then I want to help you dissect that, those 
answers as he writes them with giving you four principles about marriage, singleness, and sex. All right. Here's the first one. If you're taking notes, if you came here to learn, here is the first one. Here's our first principle that Paul is going to teach us. It's this. Marriage is good when done right. Anybody here married? All right, come on, it's three of us. If you're single, you came to the right convention. Come on. Come on, I know, I know, come on. Hey, I think that there are a lot of bad examples of good marriages. Some people fake it. Some people, some marriages, they, they, they act fine, they give you a smile, but in reality, they're all messed up. And then, this generation has grown up, has, has grown up with bad examples of marriage. Maybe it was your own home, a divorce, a breakup, abuse, verbal, physical, whatever. We have bad examples of marriage. But I think it's interesting that Paul begins to answer this question by explaining what a good marriage is. It's almost as if Paul is saying, hey, don't be afraid of marriage. You just got to look at the good examples of marriage. You hear me? And so he begins to develop this in verse 2. So 1 Corinthians 7, 2. And listen to what Paul says. For, for since there is so much immorality... Each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. You know, you know what the marital duty there is? Sex. And then verse 5 he says this, check, check this out. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer, then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. What? They, so Paul, what the, what's better, single or married? And he begins to say, you know what, everybody ought to have their own wife. And a wife be to their husband, and, and your bodies don't belong to yourself, they belong to each other, and you should not deprive each other from having sex, unless you're going to go pray. But don't pray for too long, come back and have sex, because of the immorality in this world. It's good for you to be together and constantly uh, uh, be having sex. Man, when I have a devotion with my wife, I always open up the First Corinthians chapter 7. So baby, let's study the Word of God right now. I feel the Lord. He's leading me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. He says, do not deprive each other. But I got ahead. It doesn't matter. We have to be obedient to the Lord. But I'm tired. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> because we have to be obedient to the Lord. And young people, I would encourage you to look at good, healthy marriages, man. You don't have to be scared of marriage. It's a sacred thing. Let, let me tell you a little bit about my story. I met my wife when I was in Bible school. Right there. That was, that was us when we were young. Laker fans. It's the beginning, baby. Go Lakers. We're going through trials and tribulations right now, but the Lord will come through. Come on. And so I... I, I I saw this young lady and I said, hey, do you speak in tongues? I said, may I lay my hands on you? Because I am Pentecostal. I'm just playing, I didn't say that. I actually preached at an event. She saw me, she said, hey, would you preach at my church? I said, I preach for you anywhere. Come on. And then we can have devotion on the first Corinthians chapter 7. After we're married. Come on. And so one day I asked her to marry me and guess what? Look at this. Woo. That's not my wife. That's just a picture of her. So it is my wife. That was a joke. That's not my wife. That's just a picture of her. And so then, when we got married, guess what? And by the way, I waited 28 years to have sex. Woo! On that wedding day, I, that, means I, that means I got married as a, 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 as a virgin. It can't happen. 
You gotta look at the good examples. That's what we're talking about. Marriage is good when it's done right. Come on. Come on. And so on that day, man, I just wanted I just wanted the wedding to go by fast. Man, hurry up, man. Yeah, I love you. Oh, come on. Twenty, twenty-eight years was it? Woo! Come on. Come on. You got you gotta look at the good examples, you see. You gotta look at the good examples. And so guess what? We knocked boots and we had a baby. Oh, I'm sorry. How'd that get in there? I thought my baby, I'm sorry. So, you know, sometimes you put, sorry, my bad. These are my babies right here. That's Alexi Grace and Nathan Kanan right there. I have a couple more pictures of them. Man, but God has been so good to me, man. God has been so good to our marriage. God has been so merciful to us. That's one day we went to hang out with Dumb and Dumber right there for a, a, a stroll. Man, but we love each other. I've been married for eight years. And we love each other. And we are happily married. And we have a lot of sex. As 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 2 says, Hey, do not deprive each other. And even if you're going to go pray and stop, come back. Because a healthy marriage means that you are loving each other, not only emotionally, but also physically, but you are also ones spiritually. Healthy marriages. Can I encourage you to look at healthy marriages? But, and here's the crazy thing. Did you notice there that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Verses 2, 3, and 4, the Apostle Paul says, You have to come together and have sex so that you cannot be tempted by the devil. Look, this is how you know there's a devil. That's an apologetic content right there. This is how you know that there is a devil. And I have the quote up here. Check this out. The devil is going to try everything to have you have sex before marriage. But once you get married, he's going to try to discourage sex in marriage. Or he's going to leverage sex outside of marriage. Think about that. The devil is always going to have you express your sexuality outside of God's boundary of marriage. Isn't that crazy? I mean, that's so crazy. He's going to encourage you to have sex before marriage. And then once you get married, you're like, yeah, okay, I'm going to have all this sex. No, he's going, he's going to discourage you. He's going to no, why? That's boring. Same person all the time. No, why? He's going to do that more. You see? And then he's going to encourage you to have sex outside of that honorable marriage bed. That's how you know there's a devil. And that's how you know that sex is such an important and vital aspect of your life. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that sexual sin is different than other sins because all other sins are done outside of the body, but sexual sins are inside of the body. Look, a good marriage is a marriage that has healthy sexual relationships. A good marriage is a marriage where Two people are loving God and loving and loving and faithful and committed to one another. A good marriage celebrates that relationship. Because sex is good within the boundaries of marriage. So let me share just a couple verses for you. Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5 is another devotional I love to have with my wife. Listen to this. Proverbs chapter 5 it says, May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be intoxicated with her love. Come on! When First Corinthians chapter 7 gets told, then I'll go to Proverbs chapter 5. Come on, baby, let's have this devotion. Now you gotta, gotta look at the good examples. Marriage, marriage is good when done according to the biblical principles which God has established. When a husband is loving his wife like Christ loved the church. And when a wife is submitting to her husband as the head of the family. 
that God has given us some clear lines for marriage and for love, man. I want to encourage you, look at the good examples. It's not all bad. Today, movies, books, everything make it look like this, as if marriage is the most boring thing in the world. Let me tell you, it's awesome. Especially when you get God's blessing upon that. Come on. Now, let me share with you a second principle if I could. So marriage is good when done right. But number two, singleness is good too when done right. Shaman. Oh. <laughs> Look, let me read it to you. It comes out of 1 Corinthians 7, verses 7 and 8. It says, I wish that all men were as I am. So Paul is saying he's single at that time. I wish that all men were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now, to the unmarried and to the widows, I say, is it good for them to stay unmarried as I am? And so he first gives us an example of what a good marriage is, that they have a good, uh, healthy sexual relationship. But then he moves on to say, hey, you know what? But still, being single, that's a gift. And the word he uses for gift there is the same word that he uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And in Romans chapter 12 where it talks about spiritual gifting. And he's saying spiritual, uh, I'm sorry, single life is a gift from God. That's what he's saying. He's saying, one has this gift, but another has this gift. Did you know that? That you being single is a gift from God. That's a gift from God. Paul says, being single is a gift of God. And once again, any gift of God must be taken care of and done according to His principles. And so you gotta, you gotta be able to navigate your single life according to the Word of God. Single life isn't just to try everything and see what's up. It's not to kiss a thousand frogs trying to find your prince. That's not what single living's about. Our society teaches us single life is to try everything, you know what I'm saying? Just try it. If it feels good, if it's pleasurable, then go for it. But single living is a gift which you must tend to and take care of. And once again, God gives us clear directives as to how we are to function in our singleness. Look, he, uh, the Apostle Paul expounds this a little bit more in 2 Corinthians 6.14. says this, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Come on. You know, how you, you know how you do a good single living? You live according to that principle. And I got a couple of guys coming up here bringing a, a yoke. I want to explain this verse to you. I need two strong dudes. Can I have two strong dudes? No, I said strong, bro. Strong. I'm just playing. Come on, man. Come on up. Right here, man. Come on. It is what it is. Come on. It is what it is. Hey, man. Go around. Run. 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 All right. All right, I need a young lady, young lady, single, ready to mingle. All right, the sister over there going like this. It's like all of them. Yeah, come on up, run. Run, 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 run. Go that way if you can. All right, so marriage is good when done right. When they have good sexual relationships, when they love one another, when they respect one another. A little further up, a little further up. Right there, right there. Thank you, thank you. But then there's a right way and a wrong way of doing single living too. And the Apostle Paul says that you as a believer should not be yoked together with an unbeliever. Hey, what's that down? Hey, hey, what's that down? Hey, dude, come over here. Hold this up. Hold that up right there. Yes, yeah, pick it up. No, 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 the yoke. Wrong way. See, you don't even know how to hold the yoke, man. I'm not ready for Mary, but like this. <laughs> you hold that side, you hold that side. From the edge. Right here. There you go. That's how you hold a yoke. <laughs> don't fall. You don't got insurance for this one. You know what? I need one more dude. Can I have one more dude? Just jump up here. Oh, there. Come on, dude. Hurry up.
Why do you want to be an ox or a donkey? An ox? Put that on my right there. Hurry up, man. Come on, bro. <laughs>
boxes, an ox is a castrated bull. That means the bull, I mean that the ox is not interested in having sex. It's interested, interested in fulfilling its purpose. You know, there's some some things that are much more important than sex, even, even than marriage. It's fulfilling the purpose of God. Come on. Can I tell you that the people you yoke yourself with can either destroy you or make you? God can have plans and purposes and great callings for you, but when you yoke yourself together with a... There you go. Look this right, man. You see? The donkey always wants to do his thing. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, because what does darkness have to do with light? What does the Lord have to do with darkness? Single living is done right. When you follow God's clear orders, man, if that person ain't Christian, you shouldn't be talking to him. You shouldn't be Facebooking them, you shouldn't be Instagramming them, nothing. I mean, you can see a really hot girl be like, what's up, baby, you Christian? No, sorry. I'm so sorry. Ain't nobody getting this here. Come on. This belongs to God and to my husband, not to you, because you don't even know the Lord. We ain't, we ain't even got the same king. We ain't even got the same Lord. We ain't even got the same God. I'm so sorry. That's more important than relationship. Come on. So you got to pray that God will help you decipher the donkeys. Because how, how many of you guys know that there's some Christian donkeys? And they're always in the back like this. Check this out, you remember this? Pick me! Pick me! Pick me! You guys remember that? From Shrek? Oh! <laughs> Man, they come to church, they talk Christian, but they ain't an ox. They just put it on the outside. They just religion, just religion. And God is calling you to be yoked together with believers. And not only that, I would even say the yoke is the cross. And the cross is discipleship. And discipleship is death. And discipleship means I am following Jesus. And how can you carry the cross with a donkey? You cannot. So there's a right way and a wrong way of doing single life. And so if, you, if you're dating somebody right now who's not a believer, and you came to this convention saying, Lord, what's your will for me? You already know. You already know. No shades of gray. No shades of gray. May that the Lord, the Lord, look at his eyes. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? Whatever the Lord says precedes anything that you and I ever want. Look, we live in a generation that uses love to justify everything. But it's why if I'm in love, it's okay. No, it's not. There's something that precedes love. It's called your love for God. And everything else has to go through the funnel of your love for God. Come on. Come on, Lord. And so if, you, if you're dating a donkey, you're talking to a donkey, you got you to let go about a week ago. <laughs> week ago. Go. <laughs> you know why it's, uh, I'm so happy and full of the joy of God? Because I am equally yoked with my wife. I am, man. Woo, come on. Equally yoked. And, and I never have to worry about her cheating on me or anything like that. You know what? Because I know she loves the Lord. She ain't never going to do that to the Lord. And if she ain't going to do that to the Lord, she ain't going to do it to me. I just know. I don't have to live with this here. Oh my goodness, someone's going to take my wife. Oh my God, she's so pretty. Oh my God, I'm so jealous. No, I know she loves the Lord, so I'm all good. And same thing with her with me. She knows as long as I love the Lord, she got nothing to worry about. Plus, I'm ugly. That helps. (laughs) 
the when you when you when you, when you start balding in the front, it's because you think a lot. <laughs> when you start balding in the back, it's because you're sexy. <laughs> but if you're balding in both, it's because you think you're sexy. <laughs> you guys get more excited about a joke than the Word of God, man. Oh. Tell your neighbor, come on. You guys are still here? Sick, all right, yeah, that's good. I right, stay there. What's your name, dude? Angel. Seriously? Julia and Angel all over the pulpit today? The glory of the Lord. <laughs> Do you think the Lord might be calling you to be yoked with her? I don't know. Well, what do you need to do? What do you need to ask her? <laughs> Do you love God? I do. What do you need to ask her though? <laughs> I'll pray for you later, bro. This guy knows. Okay, what are you supposed to tell him? <clears throat> What's up? Hey, well, you know, I'm Christian, you Christian, you know. <laughs> oh, love Jesus. So why don't we go? To church or something, you know. <laughs> so yeah, that didn't work, bro. I'm gonna be teaching up in the workshop later on how to bend up on girls. <laughs> My goodness, you, you have a girlfriend? <laughs> How? How? <laughs> Does she love the Lord? Yeah. She's all right. Right. Hey, do you love the Lord? Yeah. Okay. Are you equally yoked? I don't think so. All right! All right. May the Lord guide you <laughs> directly. We won't do personal ministry here. Look, there's a right way and a wrong way of following Jesus. Are you equally yoked or unequally yoked? Look, can I say a couple of things about modern recreational dating as we see it today? You know, this idea of going out to dinner together and dressing up. I think there's a couple problems with how we think about dating today. The first one is this, is that it leads toward temptation rather than away from it. Doesn't it? Man, what's, what, you know, what's the uh, purpose why you want to take her out anyway? Because you want to go to first base. And then you want to steal second base. And they just gonna let you run to third. And then, woo, home run. But that's what dating is all about today. Let's see how fast I can get her or him in bed. That's the goal. The goal is never to find out whether that person is a, a disciple that, or if they love Jesus. The goal today is, man, how hot is she? And how far is she gonna let me go? Again, we're talking about no shades of gray. No shades of gray. Look, let me tell you a secret. Let me tell you a secret. In Ephesians, in Ephesians, what is it? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. It says, it says, stand firm, stand firm against the devil with the full armor of God. So if the devil shows up, you put on your entire armor, and you're like, what's up? What up, that's it? Don't you know I'm crazy? Do you know I'm local? You shouldn't be afraid of the devil. But check this out. Check this out. Paul tells Timothy about sexual immorality. He says, flee from sexual immorality. What? Wait, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold up, Paul. Because in Ephesians, you told us that you have to stand firm against the devil. But when it comes to sexual immorality, what do you do? You run! Check that out! Paul said the devil shows up, no, you stand right there, you fight him. But in sexual immorality, you run! Ah! You run, bro. <laughs> what do you do? Think about that. It's almost like if you put yourself in a situation where you know you're going to be sexually tempted, Paul says, man, don't even put on the armor, don't even stand there, just run! I think that is so interesting. That if the devil shows up, you stand and fight. 
Sexual immorality, temptation, run. Paul told Timothy, man, flee sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, immorality is the Greek word porneia, meaning anything outside of the boundary of marriage. Flee from that. Run from it instead of running to it. But I think there's a second problem with recreational dating. And, it, 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 and I think it's just a pageantry. It, sh it shows the wrong motivation. Let me explain that to you. When you're going out on a date, you get ready. Yes, especially some of our brothers here. You know what I'm saying? You, you don't take a shower all weekend, all week. And then Friday comes, oh, shower time, I got a date. Come on. You put on everything, looking good. You, maybe you get a haircut, you pop off the collar, throw up the deuces, you look sick. You, you, you clean your kicks. The, man, you look good, you, you even brush. Brush your teeth, man. And the sisters, you know what I'm saying? The sisters, man, they be putting on makeup. And then when you go pick them up for the day, it's like, hello, pleasure to meet you. Who are you? I'm here to pick up a... Oh, it's you! Oh, I don't know! <laughs> My bad! My bad! Right, because in dating, we're trying to make ourselves, we're trying to build ourselves up to who we think we want to be, but in reality, it's not even us. And we just waste, we just waste an entire date trying to put up a front. Never knowing who we really, really are. Man, you want to know somebody? Go with them on a missionary trip where you really can't take a, a shower there. And see how they handle children. You, you, want, you want to see how good that man's going to be with children? Let's see how he handles children out there in the missionary field. Let's see, love them. Let's push them away. Come on. We're talking about Equally, does that, does that hurt already, bro? It does? All right. Just check it. <laughs> Look, there's a right way and a wrong way of living your, your, your single life. Look, I remember my old campus pastor, he taught me this. He said, he said, man, when you're ready for marriage, when you're ready for marriage, don't be the over-spiritualized dude with both eyes closed. Lord, send her. Lord, send her. And then you never see her. And he said, don't be that Christian who's looking everywhere either. Oh, Lord, where is she? I see so many single people here, all the single ladies, all the single ladies. He said, you know what? Keep one eye closed and the other one open. That's what he told me. You got to be in prayer and then looking that she loved Jesus. That she loved Jesus. Is she a disciple of Jesus Christ? There's a right way and a wrong way of doing your single life, especially when it comes to your sexual relationship. Let me just put it bluntly for you. God does not want you to have sex before marriage, period. And may I add this? There are things in our single life, there are attitudes and habits that we establish in our single life that will ultimately hurt us in our marriage. Man, some of you, you've already established a pattern of addiction to porn. Some of you have already established a pattern of sleeping around. Look, you are already creating a behavior type within you, and then when you find that woman or that man of God that you think is sent by you, you then bring those things into the relationship. Because once again, Pornia, sexual morality, anything outside of the boundary for sex, which is marriage, including porn, anything you may watch with your eyes. Look, can I encourage you to lay down your life, man. Lay down your life at the foot of the cross and give this area of sexuality once and for all to Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Come on. Come on. Look, I love this quote. We'll have to in a second, okay? I love this quote by Ravi Zacharias. It says, All pleasure, all pleasure comes at a cost. For true, sacred pleasure, 
You have to pay the price before you enjoy it. For false pleasure, you pay after you enjoy it. Look, if you're fooling around right now and having fun sexually, watching porn, sleeping around, all, that's going to come at a cost. Because the Bible says, whatever you sow, you shall also reap. If you sow to the flesh from that same flesh, you will reap destruction, it says. But if you sow to the Spirit from that same Spirit, you will reap eternal life. Come on, I think it's time to make that distinctive. We are children of God. Hey, you want to help them take this off? Yeah? Take it off. Yeah, there you go. How are you guys doing? How are you guys doing? Good. Right, good, good answer. How are you doing, man? I'm alright. Your hair looks good, bro. That's why it's called the yoke. Because it's a burden. But you can, you can drop it right there in the, in the center. Thank you, guys. Give my hand a clap. Give my hand a clap. Alright? Alright. Good job, good job. What's that? You can leave it there. You can leave it there. Thank you, guys. Give my hand a clap. So the first one is marriage is good when done right. The second one is single living is, is good when done right. And I just spoke a little bit about this one, but number three is seeking marriage is okay too when done for the, good, for, for the right reasons, man. We can seek marriage when it's the appropriate time. How many guys ready to get married in here? Anybody? Come on, someone send her a sister though. <laughs> Look, marriage is good. Single living is good when done right. Seeking marriage, it's good too. But here's where I'm going, and here's the last one. Number four, ultimately, contentment only comes from God. It doesn't come from a, a girl or a guy. Contentment comes from who? God. There's no single person in this planet that can bring you the, the, the joy that only God can give you. The contentment can only come from God. Look, we seek pleasure. The pleasure is the weakest of all emotions because at the first sight of strife, it runs and hides. The contentment, contentment is given by the Holy Spirit. And it remains all the time, everywhere you go, under any circumstance. Look, only God is really what you need. Everything else is a byproduct of that relationship with Jesus Christ. Look, young people, can I encourage you to put Jesus Christ first in your life? Because when you put Jesus Christ first in your life, all these other issues are secondary. Man, when we're thinking about, hey, should I date this girl? She's not even Christian. Really, the problem isn't that the girl's not a Christian. The problem is you're not following Christ. The problem is we need to come back to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Contentment only comes from God. Look, I know you know this verse in Philippians 4.13. It says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But do you know the context of that? Before that, in verse 13, in verse 13 it says, it says, if I have plenty, or if I have a little, I am content. If I'm going through difficulties, or I'm happy and blessed, I am content under whatever circumstance I'm in this life. And then he goes on to say, for I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Young people, we become slaves to set into sex. Sex has become an idol for us. But you're not like everybody else. You are the children of 
God. But you remember, you remember when the Pharisees came to test Jesus, the denarius, right? And, and, and they brought, they brought that coin over to Jesus, and they said, "Hey, do we pay taxes or not?" You remember that? They were testing Jesus. Do you remember that? Anybody here? Anybody? Okay, good. And it's that famous quote from Jesus, right? He takes that coin, denarius, that Roman coin, and he says, he looks at, at the image of, of Caesar on the coin, and he says, you see that image? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. That's what he says. Now, can I encourage you? Would you look to the image inside of you? Whose image are you made in? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to the Lord what is the Lord's. You belong to the Lord. Your body, your mind, your sexuality. Whose image are you? You were created in the image of God. You are valuable beyond measure. Don't just give it to anybody. Don't just give it to anybody. Man, I, I feel that, man. I just... It's just so sad, man. When, when we're slaves to something. Where everything in our culture is seducing us to set us. Outside of God's parameters. Man, we bow down at the altar of sex. <laughs> we get excited at the altar of sex. Yeah. It looks like worship, doesn't it? It engages our heart. It engages our mind. It, it, it captures all of our emotions. Young people, we got to tear that idol, idol down. We gotta tear that idol down. Because ultimately, you know what's more important than sex? Pleasing God. Pleasing God. Look, I, I know some of you don't even look for sex, it just comes to you. You're on Instagram, like, oh, something. On Netflix, it's ooh, santo. You're in the computer, it's ooh, santo. Even some of us, the high schools we go to, it's like, santo. Look, outside of a committed relationship to Christ, unless we come and die at the cross, we will fail in this area. And ultimately, we're hurting ourselves. We're hurting those that, whom we love the most. And if nothing at all, we're hurting Jesus, the Lord, Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Lion and the Lamb, the lover of my soul. I only about you to stand Please stand. Young people, would you raise your hands to heaven? Raise your hands to heaven. It's a sign of sacrifice. It's a sign of worship. And can we fill this house with compassion? Can you say, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for having bowed down at the altar of sex, of sexual immorality. Come on, young people. Would you pray that for your generation? Would you just pray, for, pray that for your youth? Would you pray that for your school? Lord, forgive us for seeking 
pleasure and happiness on things that are not according to your word. And Lord, would you fill us with your spirit? Young people, would you pray that saying, Lord, fill us with your spirit. Empower us, Lord, to be a generation of men and women who honor you in public and in private. Lord, be glorified, be glorified in our hearts. Forgive us, Lord. Purify our hearts and our minds, Lord. We give over these young people, Lord God, to healthy marriages. To healthy children. Father, we pray that the blessing of marriage would start now. That the decisions they start making now would be decisions that bring glory and honor to your name. And in doing so, preparing them for God glorifying marriages. It starts now, not later. Come on, young people, would you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, as it says in Romans. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, your spiritual act of worship. Come on, come on. The Lord is healing some hearts right now. The Lord is bringing forgiveness to some hearts. The Lord is bringing some change right now. Come on. You don't have to be a slave to that anymore. You don't have to be a slave to that anymore. Because where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom. Come on. Lord, we ask, we ask right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would break any bondage, any addiction of pornography and sex in the name of Jesus. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would tear down the idol of sex, immoral sex, in our churches, in our lives, in our generation, and that you would reign in our lives. Give freedom to your people. Break the chains and the bondage of sin and bring about your healing and your touch. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Now, young people, I want to invite you. We have a couple of minutes. Would you run to this altar? Would you come here? And, and, and would you seek the Lord in worship? Come, come, to, come to Jesus. Come to the Lord. And surrender your heart, your life, your will, your singleness, your marriage, your future to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords as we worship the Lord together.